Hi, I'm Tom Brookshire. Pat Summerall's under the weather, but let's plunge right on ahead. Last week against the Chicago Bears, a backup quarterback stepped out of John Brody's shadow, and he really arrived in style. Since the days when this number was worn by Gail Sayers, the Bears have become a little less formidable. And last week, they faced the very formidable Steve Spurrier, who opened early with a touchdown to number 82, Ted Qualley. Trying to build on his early lead, Spurrier opened a double-barreled attack led by number 22, Vic Washington, on the ground. As potent as the 49er ground game was, the airways were quicker. And Spurrier again went to Qualic and gave San Francisco a 14-0 bow. Then Spurrier went to his other Washington, Gene, for 43 yards and a 21-0 lead. finally decided to make a game of it as Bobby Douglas hit Don Shy number 24. Another Douglas shot to number 43 George Farmer was good for 85 yards and seven points. But the 49ers two-man Washington gang, this time it was Vic again, was overpowering and Spurrier had his fourth scoring pass of the day. Bobby Douglas managed to bring the Bears close when he hit number 84 Jim Seymour to make it 27-21. Then the 49ers put it in passing gear. Spurrier to number 35, Larry Schreiber, turned a routine flare pass into a 65-yard game breaker. On a replay, we can see that although the pass wasn't extraordinary, what Schreiber did after he caught it certainly was. Not only did Schreiber's run cap the 49ers 34 to 21 victory, but it gave Steve Spurrier five scoring passes for the day, which ties the San Francisco record. But more importantly, it proved to the 49ers that they can win and win big with Spurrier instead of Brody starting at quarterback. While the 49ers were inching closer in the NFC West, the Cleveland Browns fought their way into first place in the AFC Central. While the Steelers came to Municipal Stadium unaccustomed to the heady atmosphere of first place, the Browns were used to it. 
and they boiled right into Barry quarterback Terry Bradshaw. Here were two traditional rivals mired in a tong war for the AFC Central crown. In the first half, the Browns moved easily and often on the strong right arm of fast maturing Mike Phipps. When Frank Pitts converted a simple square out into a touchdown, Cleveland led 20 to three with just 49 seconds left in the first half. But 49 seconds were enough for Bradshaw to move Pittsburgh 87 yards. A bullet to Ron Shanklin brought Pittsburgh to the Browns three and then Bradshaw off a nifty play action fake pass to Gary Mullins on a tackle eligible play for a touchdown. With the Browns leading 23-16 in the last quarter, Franco Harris, the Steelers' precocious rookie running back, ripped off a 75-yard game-breaker. Harris's touchdown gave Pittsburgh a 24-23 lead that held up until the last 52 seconds. Phipps generaled the Browns to field goal range with this bullet to Frank Pitts. With but 13 seconds remaining, Don Cockcroft lined up the deciding field goal. There was never a doubt as Cockcroft bathed in the glory that belonged in large part to Mike Phipps, number 15. For the second time in less than a week, the stoic Phipps last minute heroics had saved Cleveland from sure defeat. It was only a few scant weeks ago that the Browns were a forlorn and forgotten team. Now they're back in their accustomed position tied atop the AFC Central Division with the down but not forgotten Pittsburgh Steelers. With eight wins in their last 11 games against St. Louis, the New York Giants have established at least a psychological advantage over their NFC Eastern rivals. Home has not been a happy haven for the St. Louis Cardinals this past while. But after eight straight defeats in Bush Memorial Stadium, the Cardinals felt they had a chance at last as the New York Giants stumbled into town. Giant ineptitude and some frustrated Cardinal hitters held New York to a lone field goal through three quarters, while the meager St. Louis offense managed to muster up seven points on a screen pass to number 23, Johnny Rowland. Roland's score gave promise of a happy homecoming at last. But then the New York defense barged in uninvited on number 15, Gary Coazzo. The giant defense took the ball away and number 30, Ron Johnson, put some life back into the New York attack. Ron Johnson motored for 134 yards to help set up a second Charlie Gogolak field goal. Then trailing 7-6, Norm Sneed hit tight end Bob Tucker twice on a last minute drive to the Cardinal goal line. Tucker's second effort set up Johnson's one yard game winner and the hapless Cardinals ended up with yet another reason to stay out of town.
While the Cardinals maintained their record of never winning at home, so did the Philadelphia Eagles. This avid and optimistic bird watcher was fired up and fueled for an Eagle victory. But on the first series, reality returned as Eagle quarterback Pete Lisp took a straight right by Chuck Howley and then was thudded down by Bob Lilly. Things got worse for Lisk when he improvised after a bad snap and triggered the long bomb. The bomb traveled approximately three yards. But Lisk's embarrassment proved minor compared to punter Bill Bradley's. When Bradley tried to salvage the play, he was battered for a safety, and the always prepared Fairweather faithful saluted his effort. But the Eagle defense came prepared, and linebacker John Bunny stole a Craig Morton pass and swivel hip for 45 yards. First year quarterback John Reeves replaced Lisk and ad lived a certain loss into a big gainer with a pass to rookie running back Poe James. After 14 quarters of frustration, the Eagle offense finally ended the touchdown drought on a nifty run by Larry Watkins, number 34. Watkins' score not only gave the Eagles a 7-2 lead, but lulled the diehards into a false sense of hope. Hope that was shattered on a Morton screen to rookie tight end Gene Fugit from Amherst College. Then Craig Morton turned to Calvin Hill, whose roughhouse runs netted him 100 yards on the day. Dallas's first touchdown came when Walt Garrison, number 32, sifted out of the backfield, and Gene Fugit, number 84, neatly screened Nate Ramsey, the Eagles' sole defender. Leading 12 to seven, the Cowboys received a break when Calvin Hill's fumble fell into the waiting arms of guard John Nyland for a touchdown. Trailing 19 to seven, Reeves crumpled under the constant pressure of the doomsday defense. Nine times the Cowboys sacked Eagle quarterbacks for nearly 80 yards in losses. Super Bill Bradley witnessed disaster twice as a second horrid snap sailed over his head, but he got his kicks anyway. Calvin Hill rounded out the route of the Eagles with a picture-perfect sweep as Dallas triumphed over the hapless Eagles 28 to seven. In the AFC East last week, some cellar dwellers began their climb to the top just a little bit too late. Considering the weather in Cincinnati last Sunday, you had to question the ground crew strategy. Perhaps they were adding insurance for the slips, muffs, and fumbles that would follow in their game against Baltimore. Actually, the Colts negotiated the synthetic slush rather well, with Don McCauley gaining nearly 100 yards while adding to his league lead in yards gained by sliding. In a game that was not decided until the final gun, 
The Bengals drew first blood when quarterback Ken Anderson rolled out over and through the Colts' inconsistent defense. Both teams have been on the decline and fall. The Colts all season, the Bengals only recently. Marty Domries and Jim O'Brien beat the Bengals' defense that used to be number one to tie the game. A few field goals later, and the Bengals led 13 to 10. Then the Colts unveiled Lydell Mitchell, number 26, and he put Baltimore back on top early in the fourth period. Cincinnati regained the lead on Doug Dressler's one-yard plunge, but the extra point was blocked, and the score was 19 to 17. Marty Domries had a minute to move the Colts into field goal range for Jim O'Brien to try and get the Colts' third win of the season. The Colts had lost two last-second games recently, but this time O'Brien was the hero. The one-point loss all but killed the Bengals' playoff chances, while the Colts are still waiting for next year. Baltimore 20, Cincinnati 19. Two other AFC East teams with nothing to win, the Buffalo Bills and the New England Patriots, got together last week and played a first-rate football game. The New England Patriots' new interim head coach is Phil Bingston, and Bingston's philosophy for the remainder of the season is, bang, make things happen and have some fun. His prize pupil is number 16, Jim Plunkett, and Bingston's advice to Plunkett is throw. Beginning their game with the Buffalo Bills, the advice looked good when number 18, Rabbit Vataha, ran underneath Plunkett's pass to put the Patriots in the lead, seven to nothing. But the advice backfired when number 42, Maurice Tyler of the Bills, ran underneath a tipped Plunkett pass. The improved Bills kept their feet doggedly on the ground with Jim Braxton, number 34, and number 32, O.J. Simpson, carrying to tie the score at 7-all. Late in the second period, the Bills made it 17 to seven when Dennis Shaw hit Wayne Patrick, concluding a 32 yard drive in only seven plays. Beginning the third quarter, Plunkett bombed 62 yards to Reggie Rucker. And completing the 90-yard drive in five plays, Plunkett put the shot to Bob Windsor, making it Bills 17, Patriots 14. Two series later, a 40-yard drive paid off in six plays when John Tarver rammed over giving New England the lead 21 to 17. But in the final minute, the score was tied at 24-24, and Plunkett's rifle arm backfired once again. Maurice Tyler intercepted again, and his run back put the ball at the Patriots 37. With just 10 seconds left, John Leipold decided the issue. And the Buffalo Bills defeated the New England Patriots 27-24 after an exciting football game and an action-packed finish. This week we have a special feature. It's one of the most requested pieces of film we've ever shown. Here it is.
can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being hated, don't give way to hate. If you can dream and not make dreams your master. If you can think and not make thoughts your aim. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. If you can make one heap of all your winning and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them Hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, Yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Last week when the Detroit Lions met the New Orleans Saints, everything went just about as expected. In Detroit, the Lions finally had a breather when the New Orleans Saints motored into Motor City. The Lions greeted the Saints with a shot that said, Welcome to the Black and Blue Bruise and Grown Division. Archie Manning was harassed somewhat throughout the day. And the Saints finally got the idea that someone up there in Detroit doesn't like them. That someone was Lim Barney, who belted the Saints silly, then stole an Aaron Archie pass and whistled 64 yards on the return. Then Greg Landry, who was super all day, hit number 49 Larry Walton and the Lions were gone. Landry to number 42 Alty Taylor added seven more to Detroit's final total of 27. Finally, a little bit of silver lining peeked through the Saints heaven as Archie hit Dan Abramowitz on a nice play that came too late in the day. So while one number 46 got a helping hand up, the other number 46 got a handshake. But in the end, it was the Lions who shook the Saints 27 to 14. The Lions handled the Saints, but New Orleans is not the team they really have to worry about. The Green Bay Packers are still the team to beat in the NFC Central. The Houston Oilers may have carried their youth movement a bit too far. The last Sunday, the last place Oilers gave one of their better efforts against the Green Bay Packers. The Oilers defense closed the Packers' usual avenue to victory off, number 42, John Brockington. 
So Green Bay detoured its expressway down a smaller route known as number 36 MacArthur Lane. Lane gained 125 yards and scored the only touchdown the Packers offense could muster. Actually, the Packers were carried to their seventh win in 10 on the backs of their special teams. After a scoreless first quarter, Dan Pastorini outkicked his coverage with a 60-yard punt. And number 22, John Staggers outran it, 85 yards to a touchdown. One series later, Packer punter Ron Whidbey outdid Pastorini, a 68-yarder without using his feet. The fake punt and pass to Dave Davis gave Green Bay two early scores from its special teams, and that was the margin of difference. The fury of the reborn Packer defense did the rest. Bob Brown punctuated the defense's performance with a safety as Green Bay's 23-10 victory kept them ahead of both the Lions and Vikings in the NFC Central. The last time the Minnesota Vikings visited the Rams out in Los Angeles was three years ago. Both teams were on long winning streaks. Last week, both were struggling to stay above 500, but once again, both were in the thick of the fight for the playoffs. Although they were still only one game over 500, the Minnesota Vikings were ranked first in the NFC in total defense, just ahead of Tommy Prothro's Rams, who were second. That was before last Sunday's game. It all started innocently enough with Roman Gabriel lobbing sore arm passes to a variety of Ram receivers. Jim Bertelson scored the game's first touchdown despite some rough handling by number 58, Wally Hilgenberg. In the first half, the Rams built up a surprising 20 to 10 lead, mostly because of Roman Gabriel's equally surprising 13 completions in 15 attempts. The second half was very different. On the first play from scrimmage, Willie Ellison was tackled by Jim Marshall. The ball came loose, and Paul Krause found an easy 30-yard path to the end zone. On the next series, faced with third and 14, Fran Tarkington looked for his old buddy Bill Brown, who certainly doesn't act like the oldest running back in the league. Brown's 76-yard play put the Vikings ahead for the first time, 24 to 20, but only until Willie Ellison set up the go-ahead touchdown for Los Angeles. At the end of three quarters, the Rams led 27-24. But on the first Viking series of the fourth period, Fran Tarkinen went long for John Henderson. Henderson's 70-yard touchdown put Minnesota ahead again, this time 31-27. And just two plays later, Roman Gabriel threw the game's only interception to Bobby Bryant. Tarkington again found Bill Brown and the Minnesota lead increased 38 to 27. The Rams were not done yet. Gabriel fluttered a pass to Jack Snow, good for 29 yards. In all, Jack Snow caught eight for 112 yards, while Willie Ellison ran for 104 yards in the touchdown, which brought the Rams close once again, 38 to 34. Close was not good enough, because in the very next series, Targeting once again went long, this time Fran to John Gilliam. Gilliam's 66-yarder gave Tarkington four touchdowns and over 300 yards passing, 
and Viking fans could barely contain themselves. For the day, Roman Gabriel hit 25 of 33, including one final touchdown to rookie Joe Sweet. All told, the two top-ranked defensive teams in the conference gave up 86 points and over 800 yards, and it's no wonder that the Coliseum scoreboard just couldn't cope with it. Coach Bud Grant explained, we used our warm weather offense. Whatever it was, Minnesota won it 45 to 41. The San Diego Chargers must look back to 1967 to find the last time they were able to beat the Chiefs in Kansas City. This year, the Chiefs moved to Arrowhead, and things just haven't been the same. Whenever Mike Garrett comes back to Kansas City, there's an outward air of congeniality. But underneath, the ex-Chief, now Charger, is harboring a grudge. He wants to beat his ex-team very badly, especially in a year when his new team has managed to win only two games. San Diego's problem has been one of proper mixture, how to blend a new regime with what is left of the old. An exciting part of the new is Sid Edwards, number 37. A solid part of the old is number 27, Gary Garrison. His crackback blocking springs Edwards down the sidelines. Edwards' 61-yard blast gave Mike Garrett one more chance to rip his old buddies. In five games against Kansas City since he became a Charger, Garrett has scored seven touchdowns. To record the measure of his enjoyment, Garrett has kept all seven footballs, painted them red and white, and labeled them for future reference. Now that's a real grudge. Most of the new Chargers had a less personalized interest in beating the Chiefs than Garrett. Weird and woolly Tim Rosovich only wanted to test a surgical knee, which had put him down during the preseason. But the heat of the rivalry was infectious, and soon number 82 was flying around like the wild man of old. Rosovich and the reconstructed San Diego defense took the Chiefs to pieces. Leroy Caffey and Dave Costa popped the ball loose, and predictably, Rosso ate it up. Suddenly, all those new faces that had been hanging around since August began playing like they really belonged. Number 89 looked a lot like a super tight end who used to play for Baltimore. His name is John Mackey. It was, in fact, John Mackey who set up a touchdown. And didn't John Hadle's target on this one look like Davey Williams, the promising young St. Louis Cardinal of a few years ago? Sweet catching 84 was indeed Davey Williams and the Chargers new and old rolled to a commanding lead. Before number 10, Mike Livingston rallied the Chiefs with a shot to Robert West, number 26. But West touchdown came too late in the day against a frustrated San Diego team whose season had been ruined by turnovers. This time, Kansas City took its turnover as the scrapping Charger defense intercepted four passes and claimed two fumbles. It was only fitting that a bit of Charger pass should do the Chiefs in for good. John Hadle to Gary Garrison worked as good as ever. Garrison left his defender sprawl and then one-handed it. For the old Chargers, the 27-17 San Diego victory was an invigorating moment of revenge against a team which had so often ruined their seasons in the past. For the new Chargers, it was a hopeful glimpse of a mix that just might produce a winner. Last week, the Oakland Raiders went to Denver to try and avenge an early season loss. This is Denver coach John Ralston, and he's looking in vain for a way to beat Oakland twice in a row, something a team of Denver's caliber rarely does. The first time they got the ball, the Raiders put together a long scoring drive led by number 25 Fred Bolitnikov's catches.
And the 13th play of the drive was lucky as Marv Hubbard did the honors. Following a Denver field goal, Oakland made a rare mistake and the Broncos capitalized. Number 12, Charlie Johnson hit number 84, former Raider Rod Sherman, and Denver led 10 to 7. The lead was short-lived as linebacker Phil Villapiano intercepted Johnson and gave the Raiders all the rope they needed to break the Broncos. Darrell LaMonica went to his class receiver, Fred Belitnikoff, to regain the lead. <music> Meanwhile, number 23, Charlie Smith, was tearing through huge holes opened by Oakland's offensive line. Smith rushed for 101 yards in the game, including a five-yard scoring run. Raiders continue to show a balanced attack as Raymond Chester, number 87, brought the ball into scoring range. Of course, for La Monica and Oakland, scoring range covers about 100 yards. However, this time it was only seven yards good for seven points to Fred Belitnikoff, which made it 37 to 13. The Broncos made an exuberant effort to come back late in the ball game. Johnson to number 81, Billy Masters, made the final score 37-20, but the Denver team was never really that close. For Denver coach John Ralston, it's been a difficult year, while for Raider coach John Madden, his team is sitting pretty at one and a half games ahead of Kansas City. Neither the pressure of a winning streak, nor injuries, nor Joe Namath and the Spearmint Gang can obscure the moral of this story. You just watch it. In Miami, the New York Jets needed a big day from Joe Namath. In their scrap for a wild card playoff berth, this was a game they could not afford to lose. On the other hand, knowing that Namath could explode in postseason play, the Dolphins preferred to settle Joe's hash right now. And so the stage was set. The moment ripe for the Jets, awaiting only the hero. In Joe's first series, his pass intended for Don Maynard was picked off by Dick Anderson. Seven plays later, Earl Morrill passed nine yards to Howard Twilley, putting Miami up seven to nothing. But Joe Namath led the Jets 80 yards in 13 plays, sending John Riggins around right in to tie the game. A Mercury Morris fumble evened the mistakes, and Joe put New York in the lead when he connected with Rich Castor for a 29-yard score. John Riggins then bolted through left tackle for 40 yards and the Jets were rolling. But their growing momentum was stunted on the next play when another Namath pass was short-circuited, this time by number 85, Nick Bonacani.
Earl Morrill immediately returned the favor, throwing an interception to W.K. Hicks. But somehow in the exchange, in the odd mixture of discipline and emotion that is pro football, the Jets' momentum melted. Trailing 17 to three, Earl Morrill brought the Dolphins back, passing 44 yards to Howard Twilley to set up a one yard touchdown by Mercury Morris and a 17-14 contest at halftime. Beginning the second half, Earl Morrill did a surprising thing. Earl Morrill scrambled 31 yards to a touchdown and a 21 to 17 lead. In the past, after Super Bowl III, Morrill was called a sunshine soldier. And now, happily wearing the Howard Johnson colors of his sixth team, the Miami Dolphins, this description suits him. For it is a disciplined, well-kept Morrill who has kept Miami in step in unbroken strides toward a championship. But Joe Namath had not yet been silenced, and through the third period, the two alter egos dueled, Namath and Morrill the commercial popcorn Joe who really lives in those shoes, and the sunshine soldier, one-on-one. -on -one. Joe put the Jets back in the lead, faking Emerson Boozer straight ahead. Then rolling and hitting number 89, Wayne Stewart, making it Jets 24, Miami 21. In the end, the Spearmint gang gave way. A fumble set up a 14-yard touchdown run by Mercury Morris. For the day, Morris collected 107 yards, mostly in the fourth period, as Miami took control and beat the Jets 28 to 24, making it 10 straight victories and locking up the title in the AFC East for Don Shula and the Miami Dolphins. Well, Earl Morrow was super. He could almost be our best of the week, or maybe Steve Spurrier, but we think it's Fran Tarkington of the Minnesota Vikings. Four TD passes against the Rams and a needed win that Minnesota had to have. He's also over 30,000 yards. Uh, Jurgensen has 30,000 plus, but he's 38. Unitas almost 40,000, but he's 39. Brody, 37 years of age, and Tarkinen is only 32. Some people say you will never win with Fran Tarkinen, but I'm sure Bud Grant and the Vikings do not believe that. He's never missed one game because of injury. He's smart, he scrambles, and he knows how to play football. At any rate, this is Tom Brookshire, Pat Summerall. We'll be back next week, and we'll see you next week.